Let me start with climate change. I, I, look, everybody here knows about climate change. I just want to share a few things with you. We all underprojected the rate and speed at which the climate is changing and affecting the ecosystems of this. I first wrote about climate change in a book called Entropy 27 years ago. We had one study from the National Academy of Sciences. But as I look back at my own writings, and I picked up on the scientific community, every one of us underprojected the speed at which this climate of this planet is changing. For example, the scientists in the earlier climate report of the UN said that the great snow peaks on our mountains would be bare by the 22nd century from the Himalayas to the Andes. It's all happening now. And we the earlier report by the United Nations Climate Panel said we'd see more intense hurricanes in the Gulf Stream by the mid-century. We're in real time now with Katrina and Rita and other hurricanes. And what's so interesting to me is the Arctic, because that's the canary in the mine. They said by the 22nd century, we may see a lake in the summer. The polar bears are drowning now. We all got it wrong. I'm going to share a couple statistics. Go in the journal Science, our premier scientific journal, scientists issued a study which was ignored. It's devastating. Our scientists went down to the Antarctic. They dug underneath the ice into the landmass because there's a pristine geological picture of the history of the world in that landmass. What they found shocked them. The concentration of global warming gases in the atmosphere of our little planet this morning is greater than at any time in the last 650,000 years. We've only been here, Homo sapiens, about 200,000. And the climate report this time around the new studies suggest that we're going to see a mid-range scenario of 3 degrees Celsius rise on temperature on this planet. That's the mid-range, the most likely range. It could go higher. If it goes to 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, I have nothing to contribute to the conversation because that's off the radar screen. But to give you an idea of what 3 degrees Celsius is in this century, and that's the likely scenario, and it may turn out to be too conservative. Three degrees rise in temperature on this planet takes us back in time to the Pliocene, three to five million years ago. This was a different planet. The flora, the fauna, the habitats, the ecosystems. It's breathtaking. I don't think we've grasped the enormity of this human experiment. In fact, if we were to measure human accomplishments in terms of sheer impact, we'd have to, with deep regret, this actually may turn out to be the singular greatest accomplishment of our species. In the geological record, if they look back at us, we affected the chemistry of a planet in less than 200 years. No species can claim that in history. Climate change. It's going to change everything. But now I want to tell you about the little secret. It's kind of a, I would say, a dirty little story that nobody wants to talk about. I'm really pleased to be here today. There's a tremendous discussion in the documentaries that are out, in the books, in public policy, around our need to reduce our global warming gases and a lot of concentration put on our power grids and put on our transport. Here's the dirty little secret. The number one contributing cause, human cause, of global warming is not the gas we put in our car. It's the meat we put on our table. Nobody wants to talk about it. I was with President Chirac a few weeks ago. We had just, everyone finished a steak lunch. Uh, this was the issuing of the climate report. We had every world leader there. And in the closing panel, I turned to President Chirac and I said, have you read the FAO report of the United Nations? The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization put out a report late last year. It got no attention, almost no attention. Google it up. And here's what the report said. It turns out that livestock production on this planet contributes more to global warming than all of transport put together on this earth. And we're talking 760 million vehicles. In fact, livestock production accounts for 18% of the problem we're facing with global warming. It's true that livestock only is about 9% of CO2, but what we haven't discussed 
is that livestock production also contributes, I think it's 65 percent of nitrous oxides and 37 percent methane, which are much more potent global warming gases. Today, our livestock, especially cattle, but all of our livestock, takes up 30 percent of the ice-free, land-based, terrestrial part of this planet. Equally interesting, as all of you know here in this community, but the public isn't aware of, one-third of our arable land in the world today is being used to grow feed grain for animals, not food grain for people. So it's kind of an ironic twist that the wealthy of the world are living high up on that food chain with grain-fed meats. We die of diseases of affluence, type 2 diabetes and strokes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. Our brothers and sisters in the southern hemisphere are dying of diseases of poverty because they cannot get access to the land to grow food grain for the appropriate caloric intake for their families and are being marginalized out of history. It gets worse. If you Google up the FAO UN report, you'll see that they project that meat production will double between now and 2050 with catastrophic implications for the biosphere. It's simply not sustainable. We can't make it. What's so sad is after this very good diagnostic analysis of livestock's role in global warming, the FAO cops out in the conclusions. There's barely a mention of lowering our expectations on the food to a vegetarian diet, and there's not a single prescription about it in the summary. They say rather we should use our arable land more efficiently and more sustainably. Complete, completely missing the mark that it's all about eating up high on the food chain. It takes nine pounds of grain to produce one pound of steak. So to me, it's kind of in, ironic that we are talking about our gas-guzzling cars and how inefficient they are when our meat production for our intake is much more wasteful and much more inefficient and has a much deeper imprint on the planet in which we live. Let me put it in one more perspective. It takes the equivalent of a gallon of gasoline to produce a pound of steak, all right? So the average family of four in this country eats about 260 pounds of beef a year. That's equivalent to about 260 gallons of gasoline. When you burn the for that meat, it's two and a half tons of CO2. That's equivalent to running your family car for six total months. No one's talking about this, no one. Go to the environmental community, among the people that are involved in politics and the business community, which I engage, there's no discussion of this. Zero. It seems to me that we should be spending at least as much time talking in public policy about what we do about reducing our intake as we are talking about reducing our use of gasoline and electricity on the grid. Does that make sense? Perhaps we ought to start off with the following prescription, and that's why we've got all the lawyers in the room. Huh? We'll talk about this a little more. We've got to press them in legislation and litigation. Perhaps we need to have a carbon cap, not only for CO2, but we need a cap on methane and nitrous oxide. Let's press the livestock industry. Let's cap it. Secondly, <laughs> important. why don't we seriously entertain a tax on meat? consumption. We, we talk about tax in the European Union, which I advise we, we have heavy taxes in the EU on gas guzzling. Why not introduce some legislation in the United States and uh, around the world that would give us very heavy taxes on meat consumption so that we can reduce the meat and reduce our imprint on this planet? If we ignore this question of the role of livestock to global warming and climate change, we're not going to get to the promised land. And I have to tell you, there's nothing more sensitive in public policy. They don't want to hear about it. That means the only place this leadership's going to come from in this room, among the animal protection people, the animal rights people, the animal advocates, you understand. What's, good, what's bad for the animals are bad, is bad for us. What's good for us is good for our fellow creatures. We've got to imprint that in public policy, and we've got to scream from the roofs.